passage, we find a woman who's coming to the synagogue and she's had a hard life for at least 18 years. The Bible tells us that her condition is such, perhaps something went wrong with her spine. We don't know exactly what it was. The Bible, Luke does indicate here that the devil is behind in this particular case. And while she may not be possessed of the devil, she is certainly oppressed by the devil because some spirit, demonic spirit, is causing her this problem. And the Bible talks about how she's bowed over. She cannot straighten up at all. And she's been this way for 18 years. And it doesn't seem that she has very much hope for the rest of her life of anything being any different. And yet, in the synagogue also that day teaching, as was his practice, Jesus was there in the synagogue teaching, and he sees her, calls her to himself, and he changes her life. This morning, I want you who are hurting and troubled to know that there will come a time when you will finally be set free. It may be today. It may be in God's timing. But it will certainly be when we see Jesus face to face. Now, here's the message. Finally set free. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, and beginning in the 10th verse, Jesus has been saying some very significant things, making his way to Jerusalem, preaching and speaking, teaching his disciples and the crowds. He has given the warning and the plea that all need to repent. The kingdom of God has come and something needs to happen. They need to turn to God, look to God. He is their hope and their salvation. They must repent and believe because the kingdom is among them and Jesus is the king. Now, as was his practice, he was in the synagogue and he stood up to teach. And on this particular day, there, he, he takes note of a lady who comes in and Jesus immediately knows she has real agony and pain and trouble in her life. And Jesus... That day, that moment, sought to change her life. Do you know this morning the Lord seeks to change your life? Free, finally, finally set free. Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. Luke tells us what was happening. As he, that is Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. She could not straighten up at all. But when Jesus saw her, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she made straight and glorified God. Now we're going to stop reading there. We'll come back and look at the other when the time is appropriate. Finally set free. This morning, if you don't have any of those troubles I mentioned earlier, you probably have something else that's on your heart and your mind. And even if you're so blessed this morning, as many of us may be, that we don't have any particular ailment to speak of, we know those this morning that are indeed trouble. If you don't have cancer this morning, you have a friend that does. If you don't have some other physical affliction this morning, you have maybe a family member that does. If it is not you that is taunted by and tormented by anxiety and perhaps depression today, we already know there is a world of people this morning who would love to be finally set free 
from that horrible and terrible affliction. And the list could go on and on and on. And sometimes you may wonder, does God care? Does anyone care? Well, we've come to let you know today from the Word that Jesus cares. God knows and sees exactly what's happening in your life. In fact, Jesus first sees this lady in the synagogue. There's no indication, and perhaps because of her condition all bowed over like that, she probably had a hard time seeing where she was walking, how she was moving she probably wasn't even aware many times of who all was around her. It was a terrible sort of shape that she was in. And we know, we don't know exactly what it was, some sort of spinal condition, some sort of trouble. And Luke tells us that the devil's behind this. It doesn't come right out and say this lady is demon-possessed, but as Warren Wiersbe sometimes would say, it, they may not be demon-possessed, but they're certainly demon-oppressed. The devil's got something going on with her here. Luke makes that evident. And it's been this way for 18 long years, and nothing is changing until this day. And she doesn't see Jesus. There's no indication of it in the text anyway. But Jesus sees her. Now, I want you to know that this morning. Jesus knows your pain, your affliction, your trouble. And the Lord this morning wants to speak to your heart and in your life about that from his word. And you need to know that Jesus cares for you. Now, from Jesus, you know what happens here? First of all, with Jesus, there's hope for this troubled heart. You don't think she just has a physical problem and it doesn't affect anything else, do you? Can you imagine her own heart and her life in this bent-over state for 18 years? She cannot straighten up at all. But after all of that time, you have to think, and I, I would think, that she's probably to the point where she's believing, I'm going to be this way the rest of my life. There is little or no hope in the text here that indicates that she had any hope whatsoever that this would be the day that anything would change. She likely had no hope of healing. She'd been in this condition for so long, but still she came to the synagogue for worship. Perhaps she came and found solace among the people of God and worshiping Almighty God. Little did she realize that on this particular day a new hope was dawning. Maybe she hadn't heard much about Jesus up to this point. The text does not tell us that. But Messiah had come, Jesus was near, and he would bring the light of hope into her life. You and me right now live in a world of people longing for hope. That's why it's our theme again this year. We're going to shine. We're going to share hope in neighborhoods everywhere, from place to place and person to person, and in the workplace and in the family. Everybody right now is searching for hope. They don't know where to find it. We already know. Why don't we share Jesus with the world? Now, you know what? The way the world is right now and more and more happening in world events, it is no surprise that in this year and in this time, people are looking for a renewed hope. At the beginning of the year, I found article after article about hope in the new year. Americans hope that 2022 will be better. Five reasons to be hopeful in the new year. What does hope look like? All of these articles, multitudes of them. I can't even name all of them. But did you know in, in, in all of my searching like you do online about articles about hope in the new year, did you know only two of those multitude of articles said anything about Jesus? Two I did find from Christian organizations, and of course they pointed to our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ, but all the world right now is hoping for hope and longing to find it, and they don't know where it is to be found. Perhaps this lady at this point in her life, she didn't have any hope. She'd about given up. She'd about been convinced, probably, my life is this way. But on this particular day, the Messiah is near. And listen, I pray this afternoon you go home and say, I thank God I went to church today. 
But you want to meet you. If we could meet this lady, one day we will in heaven, those of us who are saved. And I guarantee you, she's going to say, I'm so glad I went to synagogue that morning. <laughs> because it was in that place where Jesus was teaching that he saw her and he brings hope into her troubled heart. Now hear that this morning. Begin there. Because if you don't have any hope, you don't have any reason to continue, right? But there is hope. God is the God of hope and the God of salvation. Jesus is our hope. He's the Messiah. And he sees her in her infirmity and in her bondage. And he sees you. Now let's don't leave that too quickly. You may feel like God has forgotten you. God doesn't know about you. God doesn't see your pain, your trouble. Sometimes people are in a secret sort of pain and a secret sort of trouble, and it's not public and no one really knows. Sometimes they bring such trouble to church with them, and it's on their heart this morning. We want, in the name of Jesus, for you to know in your heart and have that confident expectation. That's the hope of God. In the Lord Jesus Christ, there's hope for you this morning. God sees and knows you have an affliction. He sees and knows your need. He knows your troubles. He knows your pain, your suffering. He knows you're lonely. He knows you're anxious. He knows you're depressed. Whatever it is, Jesus sees and knows. The entire world right now is troubled because the entire world right now is fallen. It's been that way since the Garden of Eden when we sinned against God. We're fallen creatures living in a fallen world, but there is hope because God is over all and God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to redeem the world. We have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So first from the Lord, what does she get? Boy, she has the first thing she needs. There's hope for her troubled heart. The Lord calls her over to him. I believe the Lord's calling many of you to him today. But secondly, not only does the Lord offer her hope for her troubled heart, number two, we see healing for a crippled body. You see what the Bible here says? Jesus saw her, verse 12, called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And then he laid his hands on her. Verse 13 says, Immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now, remember, her condition was such that she could not stand up straight. She could not straighten herself up at all. She was bowed over. She moved around about like that. She could not straighten up. It had been that way for 18 long years. Can you imagine? And yet Jesus brings healing to her crippled body. Now, I want, you, I want to break this down for you because it's so important. Now, first of all, I want you to note with me the Lord's initiation of a miraculous healing. Now, the devil was behind the affliction. Jesus is responsible for the healing. Now, let's keep that straight. When Jesus saw her, that's what Luke states. Jesus saw her in the shape that she was in in that bent over, bowed over sort of posture. He knew her condition. She made no request. She either didn't know about Jesus or she didn't think Jesus cared enough about her to intervene and offer her hope and healing. So Jesus initiates what he wants to do in her life. Even those of you who've been seeking God and coming to church, you know you're seeking after the Lord now. Did you know before you were ever seeking after the Lord, the Lord was seeking after you? And did you know this morning that hunger you have in your heart for God is a hunger that God placed there and it's also a hunger and a thirst that only the Lord can satisfy. See, there's the Lord's initiation for a miracle, for a healing in her life. Now watch the Lord's invitation. Luke also tells us this is what Jesus said, verse 12. He called her to him. Jesus is tenderly calling all those to come to him. Everybody's running every other place for healing and for comfort and to try to find hope. And I'm not knocking doctors and medicine. I go. You better believe I do. Doc, Dr. Luke could help the sick. I'm looking for a doctor around here that can help me sometimes. But I'm going to tell you this. Without Jesus, why don't, why don't you come to him? 
Why not come to him? Because we're going to find out again today that Jesus can do what others cannot do. And only Jesus can deal with that longing in the heart and the soul. There is the Lord's invitation to come. But then notice the Lord's implementation of the miracle. See what Jesus did the miracle. The Bible here tells us that he saw her and he called her to him. And so there, when she is nearby, Jesus then said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Jesus did a miracle. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. That is, again, what Luke is showing us. Remember how they were asking for signs, more signs, and Jesus said to them, You won't get another sign except for the sign of Jonah, a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, as time continues now, Jesus is doing more miracles of the same kind. He can still cast out the demons. The demon may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. He can still heal the sick. He can straighten this lady up in the power of Almighty God. He can still raise the dead. He is the Christ. He is the promised one, the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Jesus is at it again. Don't you wish we could say that when the service is over today? <laughs> the Lord is doing it again. He's changing more lives. He's still touching them and healing them and transforming them and saving lost souls. God, may it be today. But do you see that? Now, n note the text here because I dug a little deeper and here's what I found out. Jesus said unto the woman, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Jesus spoke as if it was already done. It was already completed. It was done. The clause is literally, you have been released from your infirmity. He didn't say that she, she would be free. He said that she was freed. <laughs> it's done. And where's the evidence of that? Well, she was immediately healed. Now, the Bible also says Jesus laid his hand upon her. Now that was probably contemporaneous, simultaneous. He probably did that simultaneously. He probably spoke the word and laid a hand on her right at the same time. And when he did, in that moment immediately, and that's the way Jesus healed, the Bible tells us that what she couldn't do for 18 years, she does now. She stands up straight. You ever had a crick in your back and stood up straight and kind of got that, and maybe heard something pop? Did that ever happen to you? No, not you. You know, it feels a little bit better. Can you imagine? I mean, think about it. 18 long years could not straighten herself up at all. That's what the text teaches. There was no straightening her up. It couldn't happen unless God did it. But Jesus spoke the authoritative word. And as we see throughout the Gospel of Luke, the word then comes to pass. And laying his gentle hand upon her, she stood upright and straight like she'd not been able to do for 18 long years. This is yet another miracle of the Lord showing that generation that he is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. Now, I know the question that will come, but Pastor, I've been in a crippling condition. Will God heal me now? Pastor, years of depression and anxiety and years of pain. Others would say, Pastor, cancer, some other disease. Is God going to heal me now? Will I now be set free from my affliction? I wish I could answer your question. But I'm not God. I don't know. All these years she had to live with this and deal with this until she was in the presence of Jesus. I can't answer for Almighty God beyond what the Word teaches I do not know why God allows such sicknesses, nor can I say for certain that he will heal all from every kind of disease on earth in this moment, but I can tell you this, Jesus heals. I can assure you this morning when you're calling out to God, he's hearing your prayer. And when others pray for you, God is hearing their prayer. And God always answers according to his will. And this we know that some glad morning. In his presence, Jesus says in Revelation, Behold, I'm making all things new. 
and all of our infirmities will be healed in eternity. The Bible says in God's presence there will be no more suffering. There will be no more hurting. There will be no more dying. There will be no more tears. All of these things that so many have to endure now, those of us in the Lord Jesus Christ and our faith in Him, some glad morning it's all behind us. Now that morning may be today. She met Jesus and Jesus transformed her life. Now there was a purpose in that, of course. He's walking the earth. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He's come to set the captives free. Jesus is at it again. See, the truth is more signs didn't save them. Those that didn't believe just didn't believe. Jesus had healed. Now he's healing again. And we're going to find out that not, not everybody was too happy about this. Can you imagine? All of our infirmities one day will be healed. God can heal you now. Some would testify how God has healed them. In fact, all of you this morning have been healed from something because here you sit, right? <laughs> How'd you get this far? <laughs> God brought you this far, and he will see you home. There is a young man in our community, and I saw him again just the other day. Now, let me tell you about him. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly who he is, but... I saw him the other day, and I, I first saw him years ago, and I know it's the same young man. I know it's the same young man because our, our oldest son, Austin, and we had some ice in Old Reed. You know how rare that is, a little bit of snow, and years ago, you, you probably got it on the calendar. We have so little of it, but he, he slipped and fell, messed up his ankle, and so he had crutches and a boot on, and so we'd have to pick him up a little earlier from school, and they were kind enough to let him out early so he could get to the car. Well, in those days, and our, our son's affliction was only a month or six weeks, something like that, and he healed up and he was fine. But during those days when I would pick him up in the afternoon, I would notice another young man every day coming out early with his crutches walking. And in my heart I knew, I didn't really have to ask, I already knew. I said, Lord, our son will be healed up from his trouble, his affliction, his ankle troubles. I said, he'll, he'll be back walking without those crutches soon. But I knew in my heart that young man that I saw there, it was different for him. It's kind of, it's one of those things, it's a, it's a lifelong affliction unless the Lord intervenes. But do you know what? I saw him the other day again, as I've seen him several times. And you know what he was doing? He was making his way, it looked like his new car. He, he got him a good job. And they rigged that thing up where he could somehow work that thing and drive that thing. And so I often see him early in the morning out. He, I, I'm following him. He's out for I am. And he gets in his car and he's persevering through this life and he hasn't let, him, and let it defeat him. And you know what the truth is? Sometimes Jesus will come and heal us from all of our afflictions. And we say praise and glory to God. There are others in this life who will put their trust in the Lord and you may have to endure some affliction in this life until God calls us home. And the devil is sometimes behind it. Now I'll tell you about another fellow who had to endure his affliction. He's a great servant of God. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians. You know what he called it? And he prayed three times. Continually praying, God, remove this from me. And you remember Paul says he called it that thorn in the flesh and it was a messenger of Satan, remember that? Somehow the devil had something going on in Paul's life and Paul said, I know what I'll do. I'll talk to the Lord about this because my God is greater and he is. Indeed he is. But do you remember what the Lord said to Paul after he prayed for God to take that messenger of Satan, that thorn in the flesh? And God spoke to the great apostle and he said, what my grace is sufficient for thee. Can you imagine the preacher, the apostle, penned better than 13 letters in the New Testament, established the church in many places of the world and we're still enjoying as Gentiles the fruit of the Apostle Paul's ministry 
in glory. Listen, Paul's efforts are still being added up for him to be rewarded before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And you would think if God's going to deliver somebody, it'd be the apostle. You know what God told him? The Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee. Oh, I wish this morning I could take your affliction and throw it right out in 707. Oh, I wish I could take it from you. But I cannot. I'm not the Lord, number one. I'm not God. I'm but a servant of the Lord. And I can't promise everyone with every affliction that it's going to end today. But I can offer you hope because the Lord does. And I can tell you for certain that when you pray, God is hearing your prayers. And I can assure you that God is going to answer your prayer. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait, and sometimes it is my grace is sufficient for you. His, his grace is sufficient. In a fallen world, we may have to live with some affliction. In fact, all of us to some degree are going to suffer in this life. It is a fallen world. We're fallen creatures, but God is good. And so many of us have discovered that God's grace is sufficient. Now, are you ready? This morning from Jesus, we're finding hope for the hurting heart. From Jesus came healing for a crippled body. Now, from G Jesus also brought something else. He brought hallelujahs from her lips. Do you see what happened? Go back down with me, Luke 13. Sometimes I get to preaching and the pages get off of the... Luke chapter 13 and verse 13. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and what? And glorified God. The dear lady who was enslaved by her affliction was finally set free... And she praised the Lord, and she glorified God. In Luke's gospel, he often makes note of how people praise the Lord when God does something good and when God intervenes and an expression of his power has been made. We see these thanksgivings, these praises and glory to God when these miracles take place through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. She responds with a hallelujah. She responds with praise to the Lord. She glorified him. And can you only imagine? Her long ordeal is finally over. And she praises God for what happened. You know, that would do us good. To praise the Lord for all that he's done. How many of you would shout hallelujah this morning that your sins are forgiven? How many of you would rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? How many of you like me can look back in your life and maybe not in so many years ago where you were down and you were troubled and you had a real problem and somehow God brought you through and made it a little better and here you are today? What should we be doing? We should be remembering that God brought us through and God raised us up and God blessed us and we should give him glory and praise to Almighty God. Now, you see, we're going to handle this quickly, but not everybody had hallelujahs on their lips because the leaders of the synagogue, they reacted negatively. The Bible here indicates that they were indignant. You know what they got mad about? They got all upset, and they addressed the crowd. Didn't say it to Jesus directly, but Jesus heard it. They got all upset that Jesus had healed this stricken woman, tormented woman, but they got upset about it because Jesus did it on the Sabbath. And so Jesus then rebukes them. You know what he tells them? And you can read it here in the passage. Jesus tells them, he said, you know what you do? He said, you'll take your, your ox or your donkey out of the pen or out of bondage and you'll water them and you do it many times on the Sabbath. You care enough about your beast. You care enough about your animal. You care enough about the ox and the donkey that you'll free them up to have a little water. You'll set them free on the Sabbath. And yet you want to be indignant and angry at me because I healed a daughter of Abraham, a human being, and she had been in that condition for 18 years. That's what they rebuked the Lord about. You know what the Bible says happened, though? 
when Jesus rebukes them, when he lets them know, how did you miss this? He, he, he surfaces their hypocrisy. He humiliates them. Because what Jesus says to them, you care more about your ox and your donkey than you do about a daughter of Abraham. See, Jesus was always pointing out that we need to care about other people. We need to have mercy on those and care about them. And somehow in all of their legalism, they allowed, the rabbis were allow, would allow someone to free up the donkey, free up the ox, get them some water on the Sabbath, but then tried to rebuke Jesus for having mercy on a human being made in the image of God. They didn't like Jesus. Jesus told them the truth. But you know what? Something else happened. There was hope for a troubled heart, healing for a crippled body. Then the Lord brought hallelujahs from her lips. He transformed a life. But you know what else Jesus brings? He brings salvation to the soul. In all of the healing miracles performed by the Lord Jesus, he not only healed the body, but he saved souls. And by the way, Jesus is not just at work to heal our afflictions. Sometime in this present day, if you listen to certain preachers in certain places, they give us the idea that Jesus is here to heal everything we got now. And Jesus can heal what you have now. I'm not saying that he cannot. But Jesus did not simply come only to deal temporally with our afflictions and our troubles and healing people. Yes, God did that, but understand Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. All these other miracles that Jesus is doing with casting out demons and healing the sick and even raising the dead, all of it is pointing to who Jesus is and why he came. Jesus did not just come to make us feel better and help us walk better and help us live better down here because Jesus came to deal with our real problem. And that why all these afflictions are happening in the world then and now is because of how we rebelled against God ever since the Garden of Eden. We're fallen creatures in a fallen world. Sin is the problem. And the answer is Christ. And when you come to Jesus, and see, here's the wonderful thing. Here's the promise of God. God may not take away our every earthly affliction, but God in Christ Jesus will forgive our sins. He will save our souls. And you can know for certain this morning by faith in Christ that your name is written in heaven. And we can rejoice in that. See, the woman set free from her physical infirmity was also set free from Satan's power, 1316. This is what it, some of the scholars have called this a rule miracle, meaning Satan ruled in her life and he ruined her life until Jesus came in and gave the authoritative word and he reversed her condition and she is no longer in bondage and now the Lord rules in her life. See, that's God's kingdom rule in a life. And even if God doesn't take away our every affliction, God will take away our sins. And he will come to live in your heart and your life and rule. And you can walk with him. And you can be set free. Jesus came to set the captives free. Yes, from physical afflictions and from demon possession. Yes, all of that is true. But Jesus comes to save souls and to really set the captives free. Do you know what God would do us? He would do us, do us terribly wrong if he did this. If he just sent Jesus down here to try to heal up everything that we were complaining about right now but didn't deal with the real problem, that would not have been good. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus came down here casting out demons and healing diseases and raising the dead, yes. But he came to redeem lost souls. That is why he died. And that is why he rose again. And here's the promise. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
This is a depiction of a soul ruled by the evil one, now set free by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the text here doesn't say anything about the lady's faith. Luke's, Luke's emphasis is on the authoritative word of Christ and what Christ is doing. She was healed because Christ chose to heal her and to restore her. But God's word bids the world to come to Christ by faith. The just shall live by faith. I wonder how she felt when Jesus said to her, Come. He gave her an invitation to come. She couldn't even stand up straight. Probably didn't, couldn't see him very well. He told her to come. Sometimes people are so deep into sin, they've done so much wrong. That they think what they've done is so bad that Jesus doesn't want them to come. You know what Jesus says to you? Jesus says, come. Come on his conditions. Come repenting. Come believing. But Jesus says, come. You may think your circumstances are such this morning. It's, it's been so bad for so long. You think there's no way anything's ever going to change or ever get better. You know what Jesus says to you this morning and to me? The Lord says, come. Tell it to Jesus. Pastor, if I come to Jesus, will all of my troubles go away immediately? I can't promise you that. But I can promise you what the Word already promises. And that if you will come to Jesus, He will give you rest. Come unto me. Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. Jesus says, come unto me. Come to Jesus. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus deliberately healed her on the Sabbath. And in her heart, he gave her a Sabbath rest. He changed her life. Today, the Lord wants to give you rest. Today, the Lord wants to set, finally set you free. You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, come. And if you will come in repentance and faith, we know the promise of God, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Why don't you come? God, today we pray that the whole world would come. Our family, our friends, those that we share with. Father, today we pray that all come to Jesus. Lord, when we come, we come with hope, mercy, grace. And by believing, Lord, there's salvation. There's forgiveness of sins. There's restoration, renewal. There's a brand new start. God, thank you today that in Christ there is hope. And for the afflicted life and the heavy heart this morning, God, how we pray that you do your good work in them today by this great power that only you have to straighten things when they could not formally be straightened. God, that is our prayer for our lives today, that it would be just as pleases you. And Lord, with this dear lady, we would say hallelujah. We give glory to God for all that you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you shall do. In the name of Jesus, amen. Jesus says, come. Would you come? We're going to stand. We're going to sing. Many of you are going to come this morning. Jesus says come. Come on. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. want to follow the Lord baptism. Amen. Let's pray for you. Father, I pray for Josh and I pray for Marilyn today. Lord, they got their trust in you. They want to follow you. We pray, Lord,
Lord, that you give them strength today to have no fear, but trust in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, be seated right there. Brother Love. Amen. All right. You know you're saved? All right. Amen. Let's pray for you. Father, thank you today for Mitchell and Wanda. I pray, God, I'd be a good pastor to them. As they join us today, unite with us today, Lord. No fear. I pray, God, that you just uh, take that from their hearts now, trusting in you. Thank you for them and that they want to be a part of this fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hold on to that. I can bring, give it back to me when you get up here. <laughs> come along. Come along. Miss, Miss Jody and Brother Ricky. All right. Amen. Let's pray for you. Father, pray for Rick and Jody today. I'm glad I can be their pastor now. Pray, God help me be a good one to them. We pray we do your will and walk in your way always, bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, hold on to that so I don't get them confused. Have a spot there somewhere. Aaron and Melanie. Did I get that right? All right. You know you got the Lord in your heart. You got your faith in it. You want to join the church by baptism, right? All right. Let's pray for you. Father, thank you today for Aaron, Melanie. God, I'm, I'm thankful today that they come publicly to let the world know they're followers of Christ. And their baptism, God, help them not to be afraid. But... Uh, and to be worried or anxious today, Lord, you're in control. And the family and the friends of God here, Lord, we love them. We're glad to see them come today. God, I'm glad I'm going to get to be their pastor, and I pray you help me be a good one for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you can find a seat, find one. <clears throat> amen. Hi. Dawn, and what's the last name? Right, Don Rice. Okay, you join us by letter. All right, let's pray for you. God, thank you for Dawn. I pray I'd be a good pastor to her. Pray, Lord, you help guide her each day that she walks in your will. We give you the praise and the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hold on to that so I don't lose it. I'll get it from you in just a minute. Hi. Okay, I was practicing this, this yesterday. Dave and Kathy were toady. Okay. Father, thank you for Dave, Dave and Kathy coming today by baptism. I pray, God, you give them strength and help them. Lord, I pray today they have no fear and anxiety right now. They're my family and friends. Thank you that I get to be their pastor. Lord, help me to be a good one to them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Find your seat. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll hold on to it. You got here. That's okay. I always like to pray. I want to pray for you, Debbie, okay? Father, thank you for Debbie. She's got her trust in you, Jesus, as her Lord and her Savior. That's her testimony. And she comes today to let the church know she wants to unite with this church, and she wants to do so by baptism. We give you the praise and the glory, and we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll get right back to you. comfortable. Be, be seated. All right, we're going to start today with all of you who are coming by uh, baptism. Let, let's start with uh, Seekins. Come here. Come, come, come. This is Aaron and Melanie Seekins. He, if you can't tell from where you sit, is the son of Milton and uh, Kathy Seekins. I had a talk with these two just last Sunday after church, they assured me that they had their faith in the Lord and wanted to unite with our church, and so we talked about that. So they come today presenting themselves to unite with Saka City Baptist by way of baptism. Amen. Okay? So, amen. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, amen. Do you mind moving down a little? <laughs> don't, 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 don't go away. All right. Uh, 
Joshua McDaniel and Marilyn Hill. These two came together this morning. Don't be afraid. Come right up here. Uh, these two, Brother Bruce Crawford has been a disciple to them uh, for many, many days, and especially to Joshua and the men's Bible study. And Bruce told me about them. They've been attending our church. Uh, they, too, come today to publicly say they're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, having their faith placed in him. And they both uh, seek to unite with us today by way of baptism. Joshua McDaniel and Marilyn Hill. All right? Hey Amen. That wasn't too bad, was it? No, no, no. All right. All in, all in favor of receiving them by way of baptism, please say aye. Aye. Amen. You may move down. Okay. Uh, David and Kathy Bertotti, you, you come. These two trusted Christ to be their Savior a long time ago, and they've been a part of uh, various churches. They've never been... Uh, baptized the way we Baptists do it. These are also some uh, disciples of Brother Bruce. He's been involved in their life for many years. He also, Brother Bruce also told me about Dave and Kathy. They've been visiting our church, involved in Sunday school. We had a talk. They both know the Lord. They come today to unite with us by baptism. David and Kathy Bertotti, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Amen. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to move this time. I'm going to move this time. Okay, now the other, Miss Debbie, you come. You're the, you're the other one coming by baptism. Miss Debbie's been visiting our church for quite some time, and I had a talk with her a week ago also, and she sought to unite with the church. And uh, she knows the Lord as her personal Lord and Savior, but she also seeks to join us today by way of uh, baptism. So Debbie Westmore, all in favor of receiving Miss Debbie by baptism, please say aye. Any opposed by like son? I didn't think so. Amen. Just step right down there. Okay, the rest of you, bring your cards with you. I don't want to get this messed up. You, you can, Dawn, you want to come first? They can go first? Now, y'all don't fight. No, come on. Come on, come on. Okay, these fine folks have been visiting with us for quite some time. This is Ricky and Jody Nolan. Uh, also love the Lord and have known the Lord for quite a few years. They seek to join us today by way of a letter from another Baptist church. And so we, they present themselves today uh, to be members of Socrates Baptist by way of transfer of letter. Ricky and Jody Nolan, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Amen. Let's welcome them in our fellowship. Now, Dawn, you can come. No, don't, don't go too far. All right. Amen. Also coming today by way of uh, transfer of a letter is Dawn Rice, she knows the Lord, testifies to that, and uh, serving in the church, they all, and we're glad about that. But she also seeks to unite with us today by a transfer of a letter. So all in favor of receiving Dawn Rice by letter, please say aye. aye. Any opposed by like sign? <laughs> Amen. Okay, Brother Love, you all come. I also spoke with Brother Love a week ago. You know, that revival we may be praying for may be on the way here. <laughs> Mitchell and, uh, this is Mitchell and Wanda Love. Uh, they have come to Myrtle Beach and visiting with our church here for quite some time. Both know the Lord as the Lord and their Savior. Both have been baptized. They seek to unite with us by way, uh, I'm sorry, by statement. We already been over that. They have both been baptized. That is true scripturally but they're going to have to unite with us by statement. Okay, Mitchell and Wanda Love, all in favor of receiving them by statement, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Of course not. Let's praise the Lord. Anyone else? A wonderful day, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Would you all please stand? Please stand. We'll have our closing word of prayer. But before we do in these days, we must extend the right hand of fellowship. Would you please wave to everyone here? All of you who are set to be baptized, I will be in touch with you about that. We will get that uh, settled. I've also asked Brother Bruce Crawford, these that he has been investing in for so long, I asked him if he wanted to baptize these four and he said yes. 
And so we're going to let him do that on a particular day. Probably going to be on a Wednesday night. Bruce is an associate, I mean, an interim pastor in the great state of North Carolina. And so, uh, but the others, we will be in touch with you. Welcome all of you. So glad that you're here. Did we do the right hand of fellowship? Yes. Do it again to be sure. Amen. Okay. And do speak to these folks. Father, we love you and praise you. God, you are good. And we thank you for how you're at work in the hearts and lives of people in this fellowship. God, we couldn't take any credit for what you do. We give you all the glory. Lord, none of us could stand up straight, spiritually speaking, if it were not for the touch of Jesus in our heart and our life. So God, help us today always to stand up straight and walk straight, to be the people that you've called us to be. Father, I thank you that I have the great privilege of being pastor of this church and how you continue to watch over us and take care of us. To you be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay. Now, the where is... Uh... Okay, who wants to be photographed first? You'll do it first. All right, just move over, just move over a step. You did so, step back that way a little bit. The, the guy likes to have room to put your name on it. Okay. Miss Debbie, bless you. I'll get with you about the baptism, okay? I'll let you know. You won't do it at night? Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. Okay, the Bertotis will now smile. Gotcha. Thank you. It'll probably be a Wednesday on the baptism. Well, we'll work it out with Bruce. Okay. Yeah, I think he's thinking a Wednesday is probably better for him. Wednesday night. Won't be too many people here. 